<laughs> cool. Hello. Good to see everyone. You don't seem very awake. It's the homework assignment. It's the homework assignment? <laughs> I highly doubt that. There was very few people in office hours yesterday, so. That's because it's now Friday. Friday. <laughs> exactly. Cool. <laughs> so, we. Yeah, you have office hours on Monday? I don't. He does. Three office hours every week. Cool. All right. So we will go right into it. So what was the type of cipher that we looked at previously? That's what the B. What was it? No. Visionaire. And what else? Caesar. And Caesar cipher. And what did they do? How did they try to hide messages? Simple transposition. What was it? Offset. Offset? What does that mean? They use a key to offset the characters in the string. Okay, they use a key to offset characters, but what are they doing with the message? Shifting. With the original? Shifting. So they, or they're, you can think of it mapping. They're mapping one character to another character, right? And you, that key tells you exactly how to do that mapping, right? The key is three, you're shifting everything forward three, but you're essentially creating a mapping from character to character. And so why, I mean, Intuitively, why does that work? Or why do we think that works? Or does it seem to work? It looks like gibberish. It looks like gibberish, right? Because it's not the original, it doesn't look anything like English because we're replacing characters. So the other, another type of cipher is basically instead of replacing things, why don't we keep the original letters but move things around? Why is that helpful? Or why can that be helpful? Not as uh, vulnerable to uh, analysis over the alphabet. Yeah, so maybe not as vulnerable to analysis over the alphabet. Why? Because I can't look at like a set at a string of characters and go, all right, so there's a lot of I's, so I'll just replace those with E's or something. Right, or X's or Z's, right? So if you look at the distribution of English characters, if you just switch all the letters around, you still have that same distribution. Right, and so this is the key idea behind um, a couple other ciphers that we'll look at. Uh, basically, a transposition, a transposition cipher says break the messages into blocks of some key length. So what was the key length we saw in the uh, Visionaire cipher? Wasn't it five? What was it though? Not the actual value. What did that mean? The repetition, right? How long the key is, which means how long you need to repeat that key in order to understand the shifts for every letter in your plain text. So here we break the message into blocks of key lengths, and we're going to sh move the letters in each block around. So if you have, it, for example, the key here is 3021, so the key length is what? Four. Four. So we're going to break our ciphertext up into blocks of four. So we can have something like this. ASU is awesome. So we break it up into blocks of four, and then we're going to transpose and move around each of the letters. So the way to read this is this will now be at index three. So this is zero index, so it'll be the last character. The next character will be the first character. Uh, the, what is the third character will be the third, the second index character, which is here, it'll move, won't move, and I will move there. So we'll do that to every one of those, of those blocks. So did we do this right? Yes. I hope so. And then we put it together. So how do we break something like this? Is this secure? Is it not secure? Well, couldn't you just keep arranging it until it makes sense? What? Couldn't you take one of those blocks and kind of arrange it until it makes sense? So what do you have to know, though, in that case? Um, the length of the blocks. The length of the keys, right? Because if I was going to send this to you, I'd put it all together right. and send it to you, right? So you need to know the length of the key. When you know that, then you can try what? 
You could try rearranging all of them, and what are you looking for? Yeah, words that make sense. Why can't you use the um, the way we broke the Caesar cipher? How do we break the Caesar cipher? Brute force every offset of the key, and then look for what? Frequency analysis. Frequency analysis. So we looked and tried to see what matched English frequency. If we we just talked about it. If we look, has the letters been substituted at all? So the frequency hasn't shifted at all. The position of these letters have shifted though. So how do we, so then we can try all the possible combinations. What else could we do? What if the key is really big? Like, I don't know, what if it's blocks of eight? Or 16 or 32? <coughs> Compare the same blocks in what sense? How do you know what matches to what? So let's look at this. Let's go. Shoot. Okay, I have to. Wait, how come all of my stuff is gone? Oh, wait, I think I can do. It. Okay, so. So we have this ciphertext. How do we go about breaking this? So what was your idea? So how does knowing, let's say we know it's size four, how does knowing this block and this block help us to break the cipher? Yeah. Well, since the substitutions in each block are the same, we could, when we're making a substitution in the first block, we can also make it to the second block at the same time. And well, then, so I'll say substitution, we'll do transposition. Or transposition. Yeah. And then we can make, we can do them at the same time and see, we'll probably see sooner, if, if it starts making sense, we'll see that sooner maybe. Or if it stops making sense, we'll see that. Okay, okay. interesting. So, <coughs> so, in some sense, so yeah, so basically, but it's, it's kind of similar to the Caesar cipher way, right? Where you, or the, uh, where you're trying to brute force the key, so you try different things to see how that affects things, right? So here you can say, well, what if we swap the first two characters in every one of these ciphertext blocks? Why would I want to do that? Or why do I think that is a good step? Because I get is in the first block, right? So I could do something like uh, I S U A A, wait wait, uh, E A W S, and then E O M S. But now what do I do? Oh, then you see that the last word is sum backwards. Sum backwards. So you want to do what? Completely reverse yeah. them. But then that's also going to mess up your is that you just made. Well, you know, no no A -U -S -S words start with I. S W A E. You don't have to swap it. It's SMO, not. Yeah, it's not. That's not. Oh, it's SMOM. Yeah, just close. So it's going to be A S. Oh. How about instead of that, we do we swap the E and the S. Which one here? Yeah. Swap which one? So it would be A S U I S A W E and then sum. Oh, now you want to swap these middle ones? The middle ones here? Yeah, we can do that too. <laughs> oh, there we go. So why did that work? Or why? Was that guaranteed to have worked? No, we're just trying random combinations of transpositioning these characters to try to get something that looks English-like. So if we go back and we think about, OK, for this cipher, so it's keeping intact the 
one gram frequency of English characters, right? So what was the one gram frequency? What does that mean? Frequency for single characters in the English alphabet? This frequency for single characters in the English alphabet, right? That was the graph that we saw, which is the one gram frequency of the English. So it keeps that intact, but what does this break? The sequence, so two oh. grams. So what two letters? What are the frequency of one letter followed by another letter in English? Right? Why is that going to break? Why is this cipher going to break that? Because it shifts those around. It's fundamentally shifting them around. No, exactly, right? So it's breaking what character follows another character and also three grams and all those. So you could think about similar into how we ordered the possible shifts into what is more likely. We could say, uh, we don't have any here, but if we had in one of our blocks a Q and a U, we could try to rearrange the blocks such that the U follows the Q. Uh, just like we did here, I think, that was probably a good first step, is try to do is. Is is probably a, a common word. Um, we may think that A could be the first letter of this, um, just the letter A as a word could have been the first letter of this block, so we could try different things. But essentially, those are the approaches that you take to break these. So. Um, the problem is this gets very, very large in terms of brute forcing a transposition cipher. So if you're just brute forcing this, a key size of 13. So why is it 13 factorial? Number of yes, this is the number of permutations of a block of size 13. So that is, what is that, 6 billion <coughs> tries to try? It's kind of a lot. So that's 227 billion if it really gets you. Yeah. Uh, and then. And we'll get to this in the other example. So then the other way to do it on a bigger key is to use what we just talked about, of using the two gram, that's a five gram or a three gram, n gram character frequencies to try to figure out what are likely transpositions. And you could break it like there. So what's one of the downsides of this cipher from in terms of security? Yeah. Um, actually, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So what happens if the message doesn't break up into like equal blocks. So if you had like some extra space at the end? Or like extra letters or something. So you could, it depends on what you want to do with your scheme, you could put padding at the end. Um, you could just put random letters because for the person reading it, they'll be able to understand where the real message ends and the fake message, uh, or the real message ends and these, this padding begins because they know the exact key. You could, let's see. Yeah, you can't just, so what would happen if I just left off these last two characters here and did this transposition? But then the, either the last word wouldn't be like changed at all. Like the la you would be able to see that the, that the key length is gonna be larger than whatever the last chunk is at least. Which yeah, is so fine. you would then, you have spaces here, so you need, need to transmit those spaces so they go to the right place. Because if you just had, instead of OM, if you just had, uh, oh no, not OM, ME. So if you just had OS here, and then you try to decrypt that, those are going to end up in weird places because the position isn't constant. Yeah, good question. Yeah. That's right. Can you just describe how the message maps to the encryption from the key? How the... Yeah, just, just how you got the encryption from there. Right. So it is basically, so you take for every uh, letter of the key, so for position zero, this key tells you where to map position zero. So position zero gets mapped to position three, which is here. Position uh, one gets mapped to position zero, which okay. is here. Position two gets mapped to position two, so it stays the same. And position four gets mapped to position one, which is here. Yeah. So what are some of the other problems with this? What are some problems with this? <coughs> So part of it is it still retains the original message, so we can use things to try to determine um, what that actual word is. What else? Trigram frequency, which is essentially 
see a letter in this lock? Where do I know that that letter came from in the ciphertext? Did it come from anywhere in the ciphertext? No, the first four letters. No, just the first four letters, right? Or the key length. So this is one of the a problem here is that you're only shifting around characters in a single block. So there's a slightly more complicated version of this called the rail fence cipher, which, oh, that's weird. Uh, essentially you, so let's do it uh, by hand because that will be a little bit easier. And of course I didn't install the software to get this thing to work. So that will work. Okay. So. So here, instead of writing, uh, instead of swapping around the letters in here, so let's, let's say we took, I don't know, the first four letters here and swapped those around. There's a repeated letter, right? There's two L's, half of the those things are the same letters. So you could probably, no matter how that's split up, you could probably pretty easily figure out what that first word is supposed to be. With the rail fence cipher, and the idea it comes from like a fence post, is you put the words vertically, um, and the key is going to be how you actually arrange this fence post. The fence post. So you you would do H E L L L O W O R L so I'm writing the word vertically, and then I'm going to read off the ciphertext this way. So I'm going to, so the ciphertext becomes H L O L uh, E L W R D. So how do I decrypt this then, or what do I need to know to decrypt this? The length of the word size. Yeah, like the length of the rail, like how far I go down, right? So here, excuse me, to decrypt this. I, you would, uh, and now you could read the message, H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D. You could even, um, you could go further when you want to encrypt it. So a different key would be H-E-L-L-O-W-O-R-L-D. And maybe you put padding characters here too. So why? So then you could read this off, and now this ciphertext H L O D E O R X. So what does this change about the previous method? The length? What do you mean? Oh, like the the height difference, or how many blocks you have? So. Are you talking about the transposition? Yeah, so what is this? Yeah, exactly. So what is it? What is different about this approach than this transposition approach that we just talked about? Um, the letters can be in any part of the... Yeah, so one of the difficult things is the letters can be in any part of this word, right? So the L that was in hello, instead of being in the first four characters, ends up way over, like, uh, ends up, one of them ends up here, and one of them ends up over here. Um, so you have basically characters being drawn from more of the letters. Uh, this, it's kind of more of a, um, so yeah, basically you attack this essentially in the same way as we just talked about. Uh, you look at, hey, the one gram frequencies like a Caesar cipher matches English, but the n gram frequencies do not. So. Right, the two gram or three gram frequencies don't match, so it's probably some kind of trans, uh, transposition. Uh, you could rearrange that. Uh, you can also just check. I mean, the rail fence is not very secure because there's not a lot of possible combinations of this, so you can easily check all of those. It's an easy one to do by hand, which is kind of cool. Uh, if you ever find yourself in the need to do a very easy cipher by hand, yeah. So. Um is like the key then the vertical height that you yeah, use? Yeah, exactly. Yes. So the primary security of a rail fence then is people not knowing that it's a rail fence cipher? So uh, yes, you would have to extend this to make the key more interesting. So the transposition cipher is very easy, but the problem there may be 
is for shorter messages, your key would have to be either roughly the size of the message, in which case you're basically doing some kind of Rails fence, but in a different way. Um, it's more of a historical thing. Um, okay, so we can pop through this very quickly of how you would go about this. So we have our ciphertext that we just uh, computed. We'd look at what are the most frequent two-letter uh, occurrences in the English language that begin with H. Why do we care about that? Well, because we know that the first word starts with an H. Yeah, we think it starts with an H, right? So we want to figure out what of all of the rest of these letters are likely to follow that H, because then we can try to build the equivalent rails fence here. So we look at HE is 0 0.0305, HO 0 0.0043, LWRD, <coughs> very infrequent. Um, so this would probably recommend that this E should follow this H in whatever method that we're using. We can also look at words that end in H, because maybe this H actually is not the beginning. Maybe it's at the end, because they're transposing it some weird way. Uh, we could look and see these are all very infrequent. So out of all these probabilities, which one would be the one that you track first? H-E. H-E, right? It's pretty clear. So you would try that. So you'd range it like this. And then you'd write uh, H-E-L-L-O world. Now you've broken that cipher. OK, cool. Uh, you could do this, yeah, anyways. Um, cool. So all right, uh, I'm going to briefly go over this. Uh, extending this idea is basically creating a matrix and having a key where you write the, the message, ASU is awesome. And then you transpose each of these columns. So this is where you can extend this now to get benefits of transposition in addition to uh, the Rails fence cipher. Uh, really, this is about uh, showing you what the basics are, because I, it's going to be kind of crazy. But all of the symmetric encryption algorithms that are actually used today to secure communications are really based off of these ideas. So it's important to understand that at a basic level. And you're practicing breaking some of these ciphers as well. So we talk about that. How do we decide which ciphertext is which algorithm? So we assume, so think about it this way. When we're assuming that we are, when we're thinking about considering the security of a crypto system, what do we assume? That the encryption and decryption functions are public. Yes, that the encryption and decryption algorithms are public and that they're known to the adversaries. Why do we make that assumption? Third answer. Yeah. Almost all of them are. Yeah, almost all of them are. And it's if the security of our encryption algorithm relies on nobody knowing the encryption and decryption algorithms, then they're basically the key. Right? So when you're considering the security, we make that assumption. But if we say we just have some ciphertext, do we automatically know exactly what encryption algorithm is used? No, maybe not. That actually would be a good maybe addition to your homework. Uh, so how do we test which, how do we, from the things we've talked about, how do we try to tell which is which? And what's that going to tell you? So yeah. It's a transposition cipher. Right. So how? Okay. So then, what specific case would tell you that a one or two gram is like? What are you looking at from those frequencies if it's a to tell you that it's a transposition cipher? That anything higher than a one gram is not be giving you any data. Right. So a one gram would match the English language, and a two and three gram would not match. So that would say it's probably some transposition. So that helps you kind of cut the universe of possible encryption algorithms that way. What what else from there? If the uh, frequency of characters doesn't match up, it might be a Caesar cipher. Right, so the frequency, so you can kind of 
how can you, so you have some text, you say, okay, the frequency, excuse me, doesn't match English exactly, so it's not a transposition. The one gram frequency doesn't match English. It's not a, uh, it's not a transposition cipher, but how can you tell if it's a Caesar cipher? Is it would just say, well, it doesn't match English. What are you looking for? Yeah. distribution, but it still has those peaks and valleys that English has, so it's a shifted distribution, right? Exactly. Um, so it doesn't have that, then what are you looking for? Okay, so yeah, different distribution, smaller sizes. Uh, yeah, so you'd think maybe it's a, a Visionaire cipher, and so you could try from there, and you could try all those techniques we talked about to break that. So, um, anyways, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I'll talk about some real world examples of. So these crypto systems are actually used in real world. Uh, the main thing, and this is something that those of you who hopefully started your assignment will see, we typically use XOR instead of shifts. Why is that? Computers do it faster, shift is just addition. And isn't addition basically XOR? <laughs> if you subtract, you mean, I don't know, yeah. I was gonna say the inverse is also XOR. Say that again? The inverse is also XOR, so if you wanna encrypt, you use XOR and then. You what does that mean? So spell it out for me. Uh, yeah, I guess it's symmetric. So symmetric, so that means what? So if I have A, XOR B is equal to C. Yeah, what does this mean I can do? Uh, B, is equal to X. Yeah. B is equal to C XOR A, or A is equal to C XOR B. Right? And why does, so this is a nice property, but also, um, do we have the same property with shifts? Kind of, but not really, because we need a yeah. different operator, but it does have an inverse, so we can go given, if we say we take A and shift it B to get C, we can take C and A and recover B, or C and B and recover A. Here it's a lot nicer because it's exactly the same operation, which is much, much easier. Why else, why we might, what other properties? Just kind of a question going mm -hmm. back, why would we want it to be easier like mm -hmm. to decrypt, but if we were encrypting something in a real world scenario, why would we want to use XOR when it might be like objectively easier than, an, than addition? Interesting, what do you mean by easy? Or I guess what do we mean by easy? Well, like, like you said, XOR can be done using XOR itself, but if you do it using like addition, the person decrypting might not know whether you used addition or subtraction. Right, so I'd say uh, a couple of thoughts, one is, Ease of implementation, so you want your implementation to be easy to be able to be seen that it's correct. And so if you have two different operators for one for encryption, one for decryption, that might make it more difficult. Um, we won't get into it here, but there are crypto systems that don't use any concept of encrypt or decrypt. It's just one function. Um, so that you can take the same ciphertext, put it through the system, and the encrypt, encrypt and decrypt are exactly the same, which also simplifies things a lot. Actually, I think is the, is it the same with this? Mostly. Uh, like Rod 13? Uh, no. Um, uh, I can't remember what CTR mode, I believe, is what I'm thinking of, but I can't remember what that stands for right now. Yeah. We can constrain the uh, actual length of the data we're using. Say it again? We can constrain the data length we're using. What does that mean? We can constrain the data? Yeah, so XOR is kind of native. I mean, there's native operations. The other thing that's nice about fast is, um, in some sense, it seems a little counterintuitive. We might want our decryption to be very slow. Why would that be? To make it harder to brute force. Harder to brute force. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but on the flip side, if encryption or decryption is very slow, who's going to use it? Are you going to use it? Are you going to browse a banking website if it takes 30 seconds to load? 
do encrypted page? Are you going to purchase with an encrypted uh, account? So this is actually something that um, I didn't realize, and it's super interesting, but part of what um, I worked with the team when I was doing an internship at Microsoft Research, and one of the people on the team, their job was to get crypto test cases into the .NET Frameworks test cases and into their performance tests so that that way they could improve the performance of that over time and track it because they found that when encryption is super fast, people actually use it. If it's really slow, people don't use it. And so you want it to make it as easy as possible. So the way you deal with that is basically even if it's super fast to decrypt, for brute forcing, you just make it basically completely infeasible. You use key sizes that are large enough that there's no possible way that they can brute force it in time. Cool, good question. And so the other nice thing about XOR, I mean, it, it goes with being reversible, I believe, but um, yeah. So anyways, so that's that's why it's used in a lot of places. And we can, again, we're not restricted here to, which was the point mentioned uh, just right now, is we're not restricted here to adjust the length of an alphabet or something where we're shifting characters. Here we can use bytes and do XORs. We can actually, if our system supports it, we can do 30, you know, bytes, 8 bits. We can do 32-bit values, 64-bit values, 128-bit values, and it still just works, that basic uh, XOR operation. Cool. Okay, so uh, this is, again, another instance of me trying to drill into your head. Do not implement your own crypto. Uh, why not? Why are, what are some of the things that we saw that can fail? What was that? Brute force. Brute force? Yeah, maybe. So in what ways could you brute force maybe a real crappy crypto system? I mean, if you just like run a program through it, like maybe whoever made it's not going to think about like the big cases, I guess. Yeah, what about their key size? Do you know anything? How are their keys generated? Maybe the key size is uh, technically, I don't know, if it's only 32 bits, have you ever tried to brute force? Something that's 32 bits? Seems like it would take a long time. How many do you need to try? Huh? But how many do you need to try? So you're going to try uh, brute force a 32 bit value. How many tries do you need? Yeah, you don't know that value? 2 to 32? You should memorize all your powers of 2. What's wrong? I don't know it actually. It's like 4 point something. Is it a million, billion? Let's see, 4.2, yeah, 4.2 billion. Yep. And it turns out that with crypto operations, this is actually not fast enough, or this is a, not a large enough key space. You can actually brute force this very easily and, and find a match. So this is why key size often needs to be very larger. So maybe they think that their key size is large enough, but it's actually not. Um, they can, so if you're assuming that the key size, we'll just stick with 32 bits because it's kind of easy. So if you're saying that their key size is 32 bits, what are you assuming when you brute force starting from 32 zeros, then adding one until you get to, well, 4.2 billion, all ones? What are you assuming there? You'll probably hit it somewhere in the middle. Why? Why are you assuming that? Yeah, and you're assuming that their key was randomly drawn from 0 to 2 to the 32. But what if they only randomly drew a key from 0 to 2 to the 8? Right? So if you know that their key is weak or that the key is confined to a certain range, you can actually break it much faster than people think. Um, there are, you could go on and on and on, and I could talk for a real long time about all the different ways crypto systems can break, so please don't ever write your own. I don't, especially if you're trying to do some, uh, maybe I don't wanna get into it, but cryptocurrency madness where you're creating your own thing and you're creating your own hash functions and you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, do not do it, yeah. So what would it be for people that Say again? Louder, I can't hear. Like you go into like a random function. Mm -hmm. Like I would I compare both of these. 
Yeah, so a, uh, those are done in a lot of different ways, and they have very different properties. I, I think we'll touch on it a little bit, but I think if you want to get more details on that, you should look it up. So this, those are essentially pseudo-random number generators. So when you call a RAND function and you need some random value, if an attacker can guess what that value is, that can have massive problems. Um, and this actually has been used, that's been used to break uh, poker games is they're able to break uh, their online poker games that they were able to figure out the seed used for this random number generator. So then when they do that, then they know exactly what everybody's cards are and they can win uh, the game. Uh, all kinds of really bad stuff. Uh, this has been, there have been problems in, you know, so what happens when you get locked, anyone ever get locked out of an online account, forget their password? There are people in this class who've done that, you emailed me. Um, so what happens when that happens? Are you just stuck? Yeah. They, they send you an email or something, you gotta verify your identity? They send you an email, what's an ID email? Like a, a, a link to click on to verify that you are the one. Uh, and what's in that link? Code. Was it? A random generated. Yeah, and password. in that link, right, because what they need to do is you're on the website, you say, I want to reset my password. So they're making sure that whoever controls that email address actually requested that password change. So what they do is generate a random value that they you put in the URL, you click on that URL, ideally you're the only person who knows that random value because you're the person who controls that email address and then they let you change your password. But when people use poor random number generators, attackers can do that reset password, never see it, but guess what that random value is and ultimately take over your account. So this is a problem that's definitely happened before. Um, other types of stuff that you and this is why this rabbit hole of like poor crypto implementations goes real deep. Even if you have it perfectly, um, there are demonstrated side channel attacks where people send, basically what the attacker uses is, so think about uh, password checking. This is kind of my classic example. So how do you check whether a password is valid or not? So let's say the server knows your password, you're a client, you send your password to the server. How do they check if your password's correct or not? They compare it to the password they have. Compare it to the password they have? How does that actually happen? Magic. Yeah. Usually they store a hash, and they hash whatever you send them, and it's important. Yeah, that's, we haven't gotten into the hashes, so. How, how do you compare, how, do, how does string comparison work? Like if, if I had to like have you write an algorithm called string compare, how would you do it? Like if equal. Yeah, but how are you testing if the strings are equal? Because you're not <laughs> using equal for string comparison. Minus their unicode value or the value. Yeah, so you start at the first character in each string. You compare them. If they're the same, you move on to the next character. You compare them. If they're the same, you move on to the next character. So let's say the string is some crazy long 32 character value. If you were brute forcing that just randomly, how many guesses would it take you? Two to the Yeah, however much your character set is, to the 32, which is a lot, right? Even just lowercase letters, that's talking like 26 to the 32. That's, that's a lot, especially testing a remote service. But, so what happens, okay, so think about this. Uh, we don't know the remote password. The remote password is some random 32 characters. I have no idea if it's 32 characters or not. Let's start off by assuming that we know that it's 32 characters. So we know the password is exactly 32 characters. So given the thing that we just talked about, about how long it, t um, about how we do string comparison, what happens if I type, if I send a string of all Bs, 32 Bs, well, all right, to the server? So what's gonna happen? So the server takes my input and it does string comparison on it. So what does it do? Compares the first two and says what? They're not equal. Stop. What happens if I change this first character to A? What happens? Goes to the next. Send it a little bit later. So it'll compare the first characters, say that they're equal, and then execute the loop one more time, go to the next characters, and say are they different? So if I don't know this first character, how many tries do I have? So I can send. 
The idea is I can send, we'll go with lowercase, I can send 26 requests, changing just the first character here. And on most of those, what's going to happen when the server compares the passwords? Yeah, it will compare the first characters and say not equal. But on one of them, it will compare one additional character. And it turns out you can actually detect that difference remotely from a remote web server. It's a perceptible difference. I mean, you would not be able to do it by hand, but you write a program that does that timing, and you can see a timing difference there. And then when you've got the first character, then what do you do? Try the second one. Same thing for the second one, keeping the first character with the one you think it is, and then you keep doing that byte by byte. So how many, so instead of 26 to the 32, how many guesses do you need for the first one? 26. 26. How much for the second? 26. 26. 26. 26. 26. So it's 26 times 32 instead of 26 to the 32nd, which is a lot less. A lot less. Do you want me to put the number? I, I trust you to do the math if you're confused about which one is a bigger or shorter number. Um, but yeah, so 26 times 32, this would require only 832 guesses. Wow, that's actually a lot smaller than I would have guessed. But uh, in 862 guesses, you could get that entire password that was stored there. This is a real thing that happens on real websites. It's super cool. And so this is just a super subtle timing side, a timing attack of literally something that you use every single time in your programming, which is a string comparison operation. And by using that, if you're using that incorrectly in your crypto system, you just introduced a bug that somebody could potentially use to take advantage of it. And this happens in more complicated cases where um, depend, and, and this happens not just in these password comparisons, but it happened in a lot of crypto systems where uh, it would leak information about the key based on timing, it, uh, timing attacks. So you have to, so when you do crypto to do it securely, you have to make sure that every single operation takes exactly the same amount of time or that whatever the time that it takes doesn't depend on the key, which is very difficult to get correct in a modern system. Uh, oh, yeah, OK. So, uh, so actually, I completed these two a little bit. So that's more timing attacks. Uh, side channel attacks are, uh, anyone ever notice their fan turn on or off on their computer? Yes. yes. Why does it do that? Yeah, when it heats up. Why does it heat up? Because we're just going down and diving from computer science into the hardware. Another tab in Google Chrome. When Chrome is executing. <laughs> when something happens, fundamentally, right? Some kind of computation. So uh, there was originally work that showed that if you were on a system, and you could figure out the power usage of, well, I think the original one was if you could figure out the exact power usage of a chip, you could figure out what operations it was doing. And so that could leak the key that way. But of course, having physical access to measure the power is kind of crazy. So then they figured out if you could just measure the access, the, the power draw of the whole system. So you could see what, how much power the entire system is using. You could infer a crypto key from that. Um, and then they figured out that you could actually use the fan noise to, as a side channel that would leak bits and information about the key. So these are all uh, crazy. And side channel attacks are actually experiencing a renaissance now uh, through cache attacks on chips, all kinds of crazy stuff. So use good crypto libraries. Do not write it yourself. Do we all agree on that? Have I scared you enough? So shall I go on? <laughs> okay, if you have any compunctions about, or any weird desire, desires, and it's totally cool, you could write your own thing to break it. I'm not saying don't experiment to have fun with your own crypto system, but do not introduce that at work. If you're ever in work going like, huh, am I implementing my own crypto system? Stop. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> And one of the examples I want to use is a challenge from DEF CON Qualls 2011 that I still remember working on this. Uh, this was a challenge called, I don't know why, 
it was a binary challenge, but it was a 300 point challenge, and usually the points range from 100 to 500. So it was like a medium upper level challenge. Um, it was a tar archive that had a .dex file and .jpg files. So what's a .dex file? No Android developers here? Phone book. No. Man. All right. So a .dex file is a jar file, but for Android devices. So all of your apps are .dex files, basically. So if you ever mess around with Android apps. So it gave you this Android app, and then it gave, and JPEGs are images. So I'll grab that. Cool. So it gave you an app, and then when you looked it up, this app was actually an app that still exists. This is an app called uh, uh, Picks Light. Oh, Lock Picks Light. So it was a an app that would um, store your pictures safely. This was the light version. Obviously, means it was the free version. And so it's kind of crazy. This was not actually written by the Def Punk Walls people at all. They found this. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out, so we reverse engineered this Android application. We found out that the encryption was XOR with an 8 byte key, which is what kind of encryption? Visionaire cipher. Right? It was a visionaire cipher. So it was 8 byte keys, and it was just exactly what we talked about before, where every eight bytes got XORed with whatever the key was, and so on and so forth throughout the thing, for all of these uh, JPEG S. And we had to figure out the key. And so what we used is uh, <coughs> JPEGs. Anybody know anything about the format of JPEG file? Yeah, a header. Why does it have a header? So most file formats have some kind of magic value at the start that tells you if it's a JPEG or whatever value. So we used those bytes, and we took those bytes, we XORed them with the bytes in these encrypted JPEG files, and that gave us those bytes of the key. And then I think from there, we just brute forced the remainder until we got a valid JPEG file, and then eventually we got the key. But this is a real crappy crypto system that's probably, I didn't look at it, but it's probably still being used by this Android app. Um, and so if you're paying, or you're not paying for it, you're getting real crap encryption. Um, so this is to show that like, people do implement their own crypto systems that can be very easily broken as you're learning. And this is, brings us to today of modern symmetric encryption. So this is gonna be a little crazy in what happens here. Um, and I don't have all of the answers. Um, about exactly in, in terms of, so I'll say a couple things. Uh, one, these things are incredibly complicated, modern symmetric encryption algorithms. There are, they are fully specified. You can go look up all the details here. What I really want to convey is more uh, how they work at a high level, why they work, and try to develop that understanding about that rather than, so don't be too freaked out because we're going to look at real crazy stuff. So. Um, they are essentially common, basically they're in a class called product ciphers, which is, are combinations of substitution and transposition ciphers, right? So why? Why not just use one? Exactly. We just saw. We, you just use one, that can have problems, right? So. Let's use more um, in crazy ways. This is actually an active area of development. Uh, there are all kinds of crazy ways that uh, these things have been attacked. But what properties do you want from a symmetric encryption system? So what, so what does the symmetric mean here of, of what we've talked about? Yeah. Same key to enter yeah, so both sides have exactly the same key. So what properties do you want? So you're sitting down to design a new symmetric encryption algorithm, what do you want? Verifiable. It's a trick question. You don't want to design one. But <laughs> if you were to, what would you want? Sorry. It's like verifiable, so if you can tell like someone's putting their password in, like that, that was the correct password. 
Okay, so you want some way to be able to tell that the decryption process is the same. Uh, that's, I'm trying to think. That's actually not handled by these systems. We'll see another way that that's done with using hashing um, that are combined with these, but uh, so these kind of focus on one thing, yeah. You want the key unable to be guessed by a third party? Yeah, or you'd want it to or take a real, real long time, like uh, given current computing capabilities. I don't know, what would what would make you feel safe? So you have, think of the most important document or thing that you can think of. Okay, well, we'll use this example. Let's say you have $10 million in Bitcoins, your private wallet, what would you encrypt that with? Or, so let's say you encrypt it and with a key, that takes four million guesses. Yeah. That's small, why? Yeah, so it depends on how long the operation takes, but even if it takes a second, what's four million seconds? Uh, a few months. A few months? Would you be willing, if you're it's an attacker, like to wait four months to get like $10 million? It's like a month and a half. A month and a half? That's actually not that long. Yeah. Yeah, possibly, and you may be able to make it go faster. But let's say it's some hard limit of one per second. But even that, so four million is not that big. What would make you feel comfortable? What if it was, took a year? No, I think the like a typically if you like the keys they use, it takes like longer than eight hours. Yeah, well, I'm trying to. Why? I mean, what what makes sense for you? Yeah, like a trillion. A trillion? What's a trillion seconds? I think I'm Wolfram Alpha. That's like what it's great for. <laughs> it's a lot of years. How many years? Uh, I don't know the number for this. Like 31,000? 31, yeah, 31,000 years? Is that enough years? Yeah, it's, it's decent. Yeah. Decent? Why? Because more please grab people. You'll be dead. You'll be dead if you don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, pretty safe value. Um, maybe it's a secret you want to keep longer, so maybe you want even maybe a uh, trillion trillion? Yeah. So you kind of want like the longest you possibly can? Yeah, or you need to, and again, it depends on what your threat model is, right? If this is just information that you actually, like in a year will be public, then who cares, right? Or, um, but you do want to think about that, right? So one of the things is uh, the key size, is it large enough to resist a brute force attack? So that was kind of the core idea there. And again, that resist a brute force attack depends on your personal uh, definition and your personal kind of uh, opinions there. What else do you want? So immune to brute force or uh, the key size is so large that brute force is in, uh, not feasible? What else? Yeah. That you can encrypt a whole bunch of things? That you can, ooh, what does that mean? So for example, with like computers, you want to be able to encrypt more than just text. Like maybe you want to encrypt images or videos. Or cool. Okay. So the uh, so the set of plain text messages that we talked about is anything you would ever want for it. So yeah, in computers, that's basically any digital thing. What else? Yeah. Even if you know the algorithm, you don't want anyone to be able to get your key. Yeah. Even if so, you assume everyone knows the algorithm. Good assumption. Well. Ease of implementation. Ease of implementation. Why is that important? Right, so if people can't install it and use it and understand it and know how it works, they'd be highly unlikely to trust it. Right? Would you trust me if I said I have this great new encryption algorithm, just encrypt all your Bitcoins with it, but don't actually look at how it works and that it's sending all your information to me? Sure. Something else. Okay. Any other properties? Yeah. Encryption and decryption to be fast, as we talked about. Uh, yeah, perfect. So these are all good uh, properties, and we'd want it to. So what was the other type of attack? So we we we're defending against brute force attacks. But what was the other kind of attack that we've done? Side channel. So side channels. So we want well. Side channels are more difficult. They're more about the implementation itself. So it's hard to, I'd say, design an algorithm that is itself immune to side channels. I mean, it is. What was that? Timing attacks, similar thing for timing attacks. It's a little bit more difficult. Um, 
I won't say you can't, yeah. Uh, maybe you don't want people to be able to analyze the ciphertext in order to determine patterns. Yeah, so there should be absolutely no correlation between the plain text and the ciphertext, right? Or maybe the key and the ciphertext. So what should you, I mean, so really what you want is that there's no possible way to go from the ciphertext back to the key, right? Where, which really you want um, that to be incredibly difficult, but what you want is that the security rests in the size of the key. That way you can have a very large key and things work. Cool. Let's look at one of the first uh, encryption standards here. Uh, why do you want it to be a standard? Yeah, so again, this is about trust, right? So how much trust do you actually have in this algorithm? If it's something that nobody's, nobody's actually using for anything secure, I mean, how do you know there's not a trivial mistake in it? Or, um, so yeah, it, it's just interesting things to think about of why you want this. And you want it to be a standard so that if you need to share documents between people, you can say, hey, we're using this algorithm uh, to do that. So. This was proposed by IBM as a standard for encrypting sensitive un or and unclassified government information. What is specifically not on there? Classified information. Yeah, classified or top secret or any of those other things, right? So that's important to think about. Um, super interesting, and this we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, it was standardized in the mid-70s, 1976, 1977. Um, What's super interesting, so think about this. So the NSA actually gave suggestions on how to tweak the algorithm that was incorporated into the resulting system. So why did they do that? Why do you think they did that? So maybe to weaken it, they could break it? Yeah. You say they wanted to make it not strong enough that they couldn't break it. Right, so maybe they wanted to intentionally weaken it. What's the NSA's job? Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, So at least, so what about in the computer realm? What's their job in the computer realm? Being secure. What was that? To keep things secure. To keep things secure. So it's actually, um, so their main focus historically in the computer space has been to uh, essentially, I mean, break into systems or be able to have that capabilities. Essentially it comes from an intelligence and signal gathering thing. Um, so I'm actually reading a book right now about the history of the NSA. It's super interesting. Um, I don't remember the title off the top of my head, but they talked about how the NSA at the start was really focused on like microwave transmissions and other types of radio waves. And so that's how they got a lot of their information. But as things move more to digital communications, they had to shift uh, their focus. But they also do have, they have a um, area, uh, a part of the NSA that's actually dedicated to securing computer systems. Why is that? Yeah, it would be bad if they got hacked, probably. And not just them, but the US government, right? And if the US government gets hacked and uh, so that, that's part of it is the government was uh, eventually discovered, hey, our computer systems are connected to everything and we can easily hack into people, but so that means they could probably hack into us, so we should do something about that. And not just for us, but also for companies. So it, um, yeah, so it turns out that actually the NSA had classified methods of uh, doing uh, basically like super advanced crypto uh, crypt analysis that they could recover bits of the key based on um, a lot of, uh, I think it was, I can't remember what exactly what type of attack, but these tweaks actually made it more secure. So a differential crypt analysis, that's right. So uh, it's a technique called differential crypt analysis and the NSA actually knew about it. It was not public, but they intentionally tweaked this algorithm to make things safer. Uh, which is something that's super interesting, and it didn't come out till many years later when the public invented 
differential uh, crypt analysis and then applied it here and realized that the previous version was vulnerable, but this version was not, uh, which is crazy. Uh, okay, so, and maybe they did introduce something else that nobody's ever found. I have no idea. I won't uh, think that. So the idea was 64-bit block size and a 36-bit key. So this means what's the size of the key space? This is 56. Yeah, 2 to the 56, which is how much? Is that within our safe range? That's a big number. 7.2 times 10 to the 16. 7.2 times 10 to the 16. How many is that in seconds? How many years is that in seconds? Uh, 2.2 billion years. 2.2 billion years. All right. That's, uh, so the one of the key things to think about is when was this created? 76. 76? What's the average processing your speed of a processor then? Not I don't know, not very fast. <laughs> we read that to the average speed of a processor now, right? So our one operation per second is incredibly low number. You can do these computations very, 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 very fast. Um, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head exactly what, how that translates uh, now into strength, uh, but this is what they were working with. So the key idea was. And this is where, again, it gets crazy. So again, it operates on blocks. So just like for everything else, right? So for Caesar, uh, for uh, Vignier cipher and transposition cipher, so we look at the data 64 bits at a time. But why don't we just do something with this? Why don't we just XOR it with the key? We don't have bits. We'd be leaving some bits. And it would just be, again, exactly, it would be a, uh, we wouldn't get any transposition benefits. We'd only be uh, replacing things. So uh, anyways, at a very, very high level, um, the plain text comes in 64 bits. It gets uh, transposed and mixed around and then Parts of it go into this f function, which gets XORed with the previous results. And this happens for 16 different rounds. And then <coughs> this f function basically has these, um, these different blocks. These are all uh, different tables. So the key, actually, that's a mis that should be a mistake, because the key is 56 bits. Um, and so, yeah, so this is generating different parts of the key for each of these rounds. Um, and each of these PC1, so this is just a transposition. So this is exactly like the transposition thing we talked about, but instead of only size 4, here it's, uh, I believe it's, and it's not just a transposition, because you can see that maybe you can tell that there's more blue dots on the top one than the bottom one. These are all on Wikipedia, by the way, if you want to go check these actual images zoomed in. Um, so it's moving all these bits around and throwing away some bits. And then does some left shifts on some, and then combines them again, and does some uh, left shifts here. And then this PC2 is a different permutation algorithm that permutes those bits in different ways. Again, this is what I said. This stuff is crazy. Like I. This is why you need to be a professional cryptographer to understand uh, not just how it works. I mean, the how is very straightforward because you can read this code and figure out how. It's more the why it works and why you get properties that you want. <coughs> and then this operation so it takes uh, half of a block size, passes it into this E function, passes 48 bits from the key, XORs it together into some bits, and then you have these. Uh, um, these are called S boxes. So each of these is a um, basically its own. Uh, you could think of it as a Caesar. So it's going to transform uh, these bits into different outgoing bits. And it was one, I can't remember which one of these S boxes. It had one weird. Uh, the NSA fix was in one of those S boxes to change certain values from one thing to another. Um, so and then you permit. 
you permute that output again. So this is happening 16 rounds, all of these things. Uh, essentially diffusing, in some sense, any of the initial input, but all in a way that's reversible. So these are the S boxes, which are crazy. So you could look at this, and you could say, okay, the input is this and this, and the output should be there. You guys gonna memorize this for the test? Good, I see nodding heads, awesome. Um, cool, okay, so this is just a crash course to uh, you can definitely take, I believe, we definitely have an undergrad crypto class uh, that can go, that goes into a bit more depth, but also the theoretical underpinnings of these crypto systems, um, which we will not get into here. <coughs> okay, so how do you use this? Something like DES, how do you use that? What was the inputs and what are the outputs? Yeah. Like the key in a plain text and then you get out just a ciphertext? Okay, so the key has to be 56 bits as we yeah. saw. But what is, uh, from what we just saw, can you put any plain text in that algorithm? Say 64 bit block? Yeah, you can only put in a 64 bit block. Right? Why is that important? So, do you want to only ever encrypt messages of 64 bits? It'd be nice if you did, then you don't have to do anything. So, how do you actually operate on more than one? More than one block. So now, okay, let's think about it in... Ah, I'm missing my... All right, I'm going to draw with my mouse, which always ends up well. Okay, so let's say we have this black box. We'll call it DES for now. It could be anything. This is really bad. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, works. Okay, so we can feed what into this? 64-bit block. We can feed a key first. The key K, which is 52 bits. 56? 56. And we can feed in a block. Uh, plain text, and we said that's, was it 62? 64. 64, and we get out what? A 64-bit block of ciphertext. Yeah, we get out a 64-bit block of ciphertext. Cool. So, and, I mean, DES has been deprecated. There's newer algorithms AES, but fundamentally these all kind of work in a similar way. You have a key, you have plain text, and a block size and output ciphertext. So how do you, and let's say we'll, we'll leave the statistical analysis alone for now, and we'll just say that given, even if you can choose the plain text and the ciphertext, you still cannot derive the key based on doing however many you want of this uh, algorithm. So it's, it's immune to a chosen plain text attacker, which as we've seen is the strongest type of attacker. So. <coughs> so, so we can use that, but does that hold for, how do you encrypt more than 64 bits of data? Seems very limiting, right? Yeah. Well, you, what you can do is you can split your, if, it, if you have something larger than 64 bits, but mm -hmm. it's still a multiple of 64 bits, you can mm -hmm. split the, uh, your plain text into blocks of 64 bits, and then encrypt all of those, and then send like all of them. Cool. Okay, so then we can do, so this is plain text 64, we'll call this P1, uh, we'll call this P2, 64 bits. What do we use as the key here? The same key. Same key? Man. I really got that. Well, alright, whatever. Uh, and I won't write DES again. And then what's going to get output here? Another ciphertext block of 64 bits. Ciphertext 2, 64 bits. So I could do this for every block. What do I do with the extra bits or bytes? Yeah, them away. Yeah. And I need to figure out what to do at the end, but um, and that's a whole separate.
separate problem, but we'll assume for right now we have a multiple of 64 just to, to uh, keep that nice. <coughs> so, um, so what are some properties that are going to hold here? So what, so given what if P1 and P2 are the same? We'll get the same ciphertext. We'll get the same ciphertext? Why do we get the same ciphertext? Because the key is the same, it's the same input, we should get the same output. If that wasn't the case, what could we not do? Decrypt it. Decrypt, right? We can never go backwards. Right? So it has to hold. What does that mean for a crypto system? What was that? Yeah, so it's a one-to-one -one mapping. And so... <coughs> So this is, you just invented uh, electronic code books, ECB mode, which is uh, one of the older styles, which we'll talk about. And the idea is exactly like we just talked about, split the plain text up into blocks, use the key, and encrypt the ciphertext. And where is my image? Cool. So one of the problems here is that Due to the block size, right? Even though the text is is randomized, so um, aspects of the plain text message can still leak out. So here's an example. This is a this is the Linux Penguin in I believe it's raw character mode. So there's a like RGB value per pixel, so it's not a JPEG or anything. So taking this and encrypting it with a key in ECB mode shows this. And why is that? What was it? Yeah, so it's encrypting 64 bits, right? So just mapping certain bits to other bits. Yeah. Uh, all, the all the black colors have the same RGB value, so when you encrypt it, they'll become encrypted the same ciphertext. Yeah, and then all the outside the transparent value gets encrypted the same ciphertext. The, even though there's no real cor correlation here, because once the, when one bit of the plain text is different, the cipher text should be different as well, like uh, very different. Um, and so is this a problem? Yeah. Because why did you encrypt this image? So no one would know what it was. So no one would know what it was. But if you sent this to somebody and they did this, do they know what you sent? Yes. Yes, you're still leaking patterns of the plain text through here. Oh no, we're over time. All right, we'll revisit Tux in a second. Okay, think of ways to fix that.